Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Eck, and today we're going to talk about rational expressions, which is a really interesting type of mathematical object. It's also something that uh, folks can find really challenging. I think they find it challenging often because there's just so many different rules about fractions that are involved. Uh, so let's understand what a rational expression is first. Rational means it's a ratio or a fraction. Same as rational numbers. Expression means not an equation. So we're dealing with things right now that are not really equations, um, but that are fractions. Well, why don't we just call them fractions? Well, it's because they're fractions of polynomials. So an example or the most general rational expression is something of the form p of x divided by q of x, where both p and q are polynomials. Um, why do we use p and q? Probably because p stands for polynomial and q is next in the alphabet. Um, but it could be, of course, anything. Here's some examples of rational expressions, and we are going to solve both of these later, uh, or simplify both of them later. Uh, so the first example you'll notice is x plus 7 over x squared minus 49. Uh, why is this a rational expression? Well, because there is a fraction bar, so it is a, a ratio. Uh, x plus 7 is a polynomial, and x squared minus 49 is a polynomial. So that's a perfectly wonderful example of a rational expression, uh, and we can, of course, do plenty of things with that. Here's another example of a rational expression. I'm not going to read that one out loud. It's, it's pretty big. Um, but what you might notice is that it, it can have multiple terms. Um, we are going to be teaching you, working this section, in how do you combine those terms and what do you do with that expression once you, you have everything all, all out there. So eventually our goal will be to take something like this and simplify it until it's in a form p of, p of x over q of x. Right now this thing is, of course, not yet simplified. So you can't look at it and say, ah, here's my p, here's my q, here's my numerator, denominator. So that nothing we can do with that yet. Uh, another key idea of rational expressions is the idea of domain. So let's look at that. Um, and whenever you have a fraction, 2 over x, there's one thing that you really, really have to avoid. And that is division by 0. Division by 0 is uh, not well defined. It, it causes an error. Uh, we can talk about why that is maybe a later at a different time. Um, but right now, we would just want to say we want to avoid dividing by 0. So say that we had, uh, we'll just do a little sidebar up here. Say that I had the rational expression 2 over x. I would need to include with that expression the, the sort of caveat or warning to the reader that x cannot equal 0. If I don't forbid that, uh, then I might be handing my reader or handing my, my user something where they would be risking division by 0. So we always add something to this, and we always say, we call this the excluded values of that rational expression. Uh, so the key idea is that if you're making a rational expression or you're simplifying one, it's not complete until you have stated the excluded values in some way, and it's actually going to be the first thing that you want to do before you do any reducing or simplifying. Um, that's really important. I will add, though, that uh, you know factoring doesn't actually count as simplifying in this sense, so you do want to factor first and then do excluded values. Here's what I mean. Let's go back to this x plus 7 over x squared minus 49. I know that the denominator polynomial is a, perfect, is a difference of squares, so this could simplify into x plus 7 divided by x plus 7 oh, times x minus 7. Just that, that perfect square factor. Now I'm going to do uh, one thing. So you might get excited and go, oh, x plus 7, x plus 7. Let me, let me start crossing things out. Not yet. Because this is the point when it's fully factored where you say, all right, my excluded values and I'll write that x cannot equal. And I, what are my excluded values? They are the things that would make the denominator 0. So x plus 7 is 0 if x is negative 7, x minus 7 is 0 if x is positive 7. It's just the opposite sign of, of that term. Uh, so the excluded values are going to be 7 
and negative 7. You can list them in a, in a little list like this. Um, often you will, you know, from basically here on out, we'll also write just EV instead of excluded value, the whole phrase. But you always want to include that. Once you've got it, you're done. You, you, can, you don't have to um, keep listing it. You can just circle it and say there's the excluded values. But now I want to reduce this because what I do see now that you factored it is that you have an x plus 7 on the top and an x plus 7 on the bottom. We're going to talk more about this reduction in a little in a sec, but for now, uh, this is what you should do. You have the same term on the top and the bottom, and there's nothing else going on. Those reduce to 1. So this is basically x plus 7 over x plus 7 is basically like 1 over 1, which uh, we don't need to write the 1 on the bottom, but we do need to write the 1 on the top. So this should reduce to 1 over x minus 7. That's our final answer. Um, but here's something that kind of trips people up. What often I find students doing, it's a weird one. So I'm going to, uh, what I find students doing, excuse me about all that, was saying, ah, oh, I've simplified this. Now my excluded values are just positive 7. Well, there's a problem with that. This is not the expression, this guy is not the expression you were, you're given. This is the expression you were given. The expression you were given had those excluded values plus and minus 7. And so by reducing, reducing it, you can kind of cross out some excluded values, which is maybe seems good. The problem is that those values need to stay excluded. So the excluded value of 7 and minus 7 are true for both of these because the second one, 1 over x minus 7, came from the first one, the unreduced version. Um, why don't we talk about why that is? I, I wanted to save that for a little later, but I think now is a good time to talk about why that's true. So why is this true that the excluded values uh, retain all of the, the values that have been excluded? They don't, they don't uh, go away. Well, uh, somewhere deep in the land of fractions, whenever you learned your fraction, right in the, in the book of mathematics, uh, somewhere there's, there's written down all the rules of fractions. Um, and the rule of fractions probably says something like this a divided by a can be reduced to 1 or 1 over 1 or however we're going to write it. That's clearly always going to be true, but I bet you if you keep reading, it's going to say if a is not equal to 0. That is, the rule is only applicable, the rule of like canceling and dividing is only applicable if that number is not 0 already. So in the expression we had above, we kind of had, we had an x plus 7 minus 7, we kind of had things of the form a over ab. Well, then a over a certainly is equal to 1. So this is certainly equal to, you know, 1 over 1b. However, for this rule to apply, because of this reason, we need a to not be 0, right? So we still need that not to be 0. And if we get rid of that, we've, we've kind of not applied the right rules of math when we did the canceling. There's the whole thing all together. So that's why we keep the excluded value um, of this. Uh, what is true, though, and, and what you know we'll see later, is that this expression and this expression have essentially the same graph. So they have different excluded values. You did simplify them down. Um, they're relative, roughly equivalent. The only difference is that excluded value that makes them uh, have, there's like literally one point uh, less on the graph of the more complicated expression. But we'll come to all that in chapter two. Uh, let's do another example of uh, just normal reducing. Uh, so here you don't have to have x. You could have, a, of course, a polynomial in y. And here is one in y. Um, I chose this one. Oh, I shouldn't write that. Because it makes you factor first. So don't forget your factoring rules. You have a polynomial. It's a square. So you're going to factor it into two polynomials on the top and two polynomials on the bottom. Pause the video and see if you can figure out what they are. Okay, there they are. I just had to pause and check my own factoring. Uh, so now we're going to, we've got the top and bottom factored, but we haven't reduced anything. You have to state your excluded values before you reduce anything. So I'm going to write the excluded values are whatever would make the denominator equal to zero. So the excluded values here are, uh, oh, not x, y should not be negative one or uh, negative four right? The opposites of the values in the 
bottom terms. So I've got those listed. I'll go ahead and circle it so I don't lose track of it. Now we can do some reducing though. Because I have on the top a y plus 1 and on the bottom a y plus 1, and it's important to note that these were kind of these are now multiplied together, so it's there's no like weird addition going on. Uh, those two can reduce out to one and one. And so this all together, we should not write that, should be y minus five over y plus four. So that would be the simplified expression. Uh, but it does have, of course, these excluded values. Even though we canceled out the one term, y uh, can't, should still not be allowed to be negative 1, because if it were allowed to be negative 1, then the canceling wouldn't have been legal anyway, so we have to keep excluding. While I was planning this video, I was thinking a lot about canceling, because it's something that uh, I think we, we see in class and we do without often thinking about it. So I wanted to just do a little sidebar on what's legal and what's not legal. I'm going to give you an example of something that's bad. Uh, so say I had the same expression that we just solved. We know what the answer is now. Um, but say that you were walking around and I said, all right, guys, let's simplify this really quick. Uh, y squareds cancel with y squareds. Great. Uh, and let's see. And fours cancel with fours. And fives cancel with fives. So this is really equal to negative y over y, which is then equal to negative one. Done. Is that true? Isn't that legal? No! In no way is this legal. Um, and that's kind of a ridiculous example, but it's one that people will do and people will try. Uh, so I really want you to kind of pay some attention to the different rules of canceling. When can you cancel stuff? When can you not? Uh, all right. So here's another expression. This is maybe a little less ridiculous. Uh, what could cancel? I'm putting cancel in quotes, by the way, because we really should be saying reduce uh, to 1. Cancel doesn't have a mathematical meaning. It's a it's mathematicians find no meaning in that word, even though we use it all the time. Um, but which of these things could reduce out? So you might say to yourself, aha, aha, I see. The x plus 1s can reduce out. If you did that, though, you would be making a error and the reason is because there is that x in front so you can't reduce or cancel something out of a polynomial unless you're canceling it uh, or a polynomial of multiple terms unless you're canceling it out of every term and this term is not have an x plus one to cancel out um, so let's go over the real fraction rules what are the real rules of all this stuff uh, we already wrote you know the first one which is c over c divides and makes 1 as long as that number is not 0. So you can reduce to 1 as long as you have something that's not 0. All right, what about adding? Uh, so you say you have something of the form a plus b over c. Well, what can you do with this? The only thing that you can do is split it up. And here's how you split it up. It turns into a over c plus b over c. That is perfectly legal. Um, it's basically reverse addition, right? So if you get, went the other way, you're just adding the fractions. But you can reverse add fractions by turning them into 2. Now what if you had AC plus BC over C? So I've, I've thrown a C on the top term. Here is where you can start thinking about canceling. There's a couple ways to think about it. Way 1. Uh, that's not a friendly color. Green's a friendly color. Way 1. AC plus BC over C could be turned into AC over C plus BC over C by the, the rule above that we just stated. And then by the rule about C over C reducing to 1, this could be simplified into A times C over C plus B times C over C. And that could be simplified into A plus b, because all c over c's would reduce to 1. So in this case, uh, th this is the, the official mathematical way. Uh, what someone would probably do, and what you'll, you'll see on your paper and in your classmates, is they'll go, ah, and just cross all the c's out. But that is, in fact, in this case, legal, because you had a c in every term. And since you had a c in every term, it turns out that they would split up and reduce out.
However, if you were missing that C, say in the first term, to kind of be in a, an example like we were uh, above, then the C's in this term no longer, like you wouldn't have that C there, so you wouldn't have this C there, so you wouldn't be able to do that step anymore because you'd be missing a C. So you'd have to have C's in all places. I also wanted to show you another way to approach this problem. Um, I actually like it better. You can also factor the C out of the top. Now you have a single fraction uh, with a multiple of C times A plus B divided by C. In this case, those will reduce to one and those get A plus B again. So there's a couple ways to approach it, um, but you do have to have, if you're gonna kind of cross things out, you do have to have a C in both terms. And that that's why this was not legal, is because this is kind of like our A and B and C. We didn't have that X plus one in both terms, so we weren't able to uh, cross out the X plus one. By the way, uh, I've been listing kind of the rules of fractions, what you can do with addition, you can split it up, uh, you can cross, you can cancel things out. Here's what's not a rule. Um, this is not legal. You cannot split the denominator into something like uh, C over A plus C over B. Can't do it. Whoa there. Got so excited, it screwed up the video. Um, can't do that. And you can, t uh, there's a number of reasons why. First reason, plug in some numbers and probably any three random numbers you choose, it will be really, really clear that it's not true. So that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is just thinking about what fractions mean. In a fraction, the numerator and denominator mean completely different things. The numerator is like the number of things you have. And the denominator is like the number, if you're thinking about like pizza, right? Like remember this. This is, The denominator is like the number of slices of the pizza. And if you have a plus B slices, and you try to break that up, you're changing the whole fundamental of the problem. You're changing the way the pizzas are cut up. When you add or subtract things on the top, you're just changing the number of slices that are like colored in or, or taken or whatever your metaphor is. But when you change the bottom, you're changing the, the, the entire situation, which is why that's not legal. Uh, so just be really careful of that. And it's going to happen. There's going to be some problems. You'll be doing them and you'll say, ah, I wish I could do this because it makes things easy if you can break the law. If you can break the rules of math, often a lot of problems are easier. Surprise. Uh, so try to avoid that. Okay, so coming back to this problem um, that we wrote and said you can't just cross cancel, let's go ahead and simplify it and solve it uh, because you know, let's see what you can do. I told you what you can't do. Uh, first, everything looks pretty factored, so I'm gonna make note what my excluded values are. X should not be negative one. Circle that, that's the only one. Y is from that term right there. Uh, when you don't think, have things that don't cancel or, or do anything, the best that you can do, I should stop writing that equals, the best you can do is simplify the terms in the top. So 3x needs to go to both terms, so you should have x minus 3x squared uh, minus 1 times 3x, which is just minus 3x over x plus 1. Okay, uh, after that, Let's write it as negative 3x squared plus, ooh, we have an x minus 3x, so that would be uh, minus 2x over an x plus 1. Uh, does anything factor out of the top? No, I could write it as negative 3x squared plus 2x. Oh, here, why don't we write it as negative x? Mm. Hold on. But I can also pull an x out, so I'm going to write it as negative x, x uh, times 3x plus 2 over x plus 1. And this is simplified into a single polynomial on the top and a single polynomial on the bottom. And we have excluded values, and so that would be a good place to leave it. You could probably have left it here, and it would also be fine. There's not really a difference. Um, so not much you can do there. What if, though, I take the same problem and just change the bottom to have just an x? Now look at look at this. We have an x on the top in the term, like the a term, 
We have an x in the b term, and we have an x in the c term. So in this case, all three of those x's would actually cancel out, reduce out with each other. And you could write this, uh, just write this as negative 3x plus 1 uh, with the excluded value x not equal 0, because you still need that excluded value. Otherwise, you couldn't have canceled it. By the way, uh, and if you're still a little hazy, why are you allowed to cancel that? Think about factoring that x out. Since it was in both terms, you could write this as x paren. What? I did something wrong. I did something wrong, and I didn't even do it on purpose this time, and you caught me. This is not right. When you cancel an x with an x, they don't just go away. This is why we don't use the word cancel. What word should we use? Reduce to 1. So what should I have written here? A 1. And I should have 1 minus 3 x plus 1. The way I figured out my error is by trying to do this the other way. You can take this and factor out that x and it becomes 1 minus 3 x plus 1 with the x factored out divided by x. The x is reduced. And we're left with this term. So that's the correct solution, and I guess it's a really good reason that you should be really careful with your factoring. So now we're going to move on to talk about multiplying rational expressions. Uh, to review how multiplying works with fractions, if you have a over b times c over d, unlike with addition, you can multiply the numerators, a times c, and multiply the denominators, b times d. That's how you do it. You multiply the numerators, you multiply the denominators. Totally, it's different than addition. Uh, addition, you have a common denominator. Multiplying, uh, which we're going to come to, by the way. Multiplying is actually, in this case, easier than addition. Okay, whoa there. So here's an example of two multiplied uh, rational expressions. Seems pretty messy, huh? I don't want, so here's what I could do. I could, I'm going to work down instead of over. Uh, I could, of course, multiply this term times this term. And I would have to do, you know, this times that and this times that and distribute everything out. That sounds miserable. Um, I would end up with at least an x cubed, and then I'd probably have to factor the darn thing anyway. So it turns out that before you multiply anything, what you should do is factor it first. And I see a lot of opportunities for factoring in this thing. Let's break it apart. So we're going to break it apart. Don't treat it just like two completely different. We'll even do it in two different colors. Treat it like two completely different expressions that aren't even related to each other. Um, x squared minus 4 factors into x plus 2. x minus 2. x squared minus 4x plus 4. Uh, is that a perfect square pattern? Yes, it is. So that's going to be x plus 2. Nope. Uh, it's minus 4. So it's minus 2 times x minus 2. Ah, and I already am, and see why I might have done that is that I can maybe get some things to reduce to 1. But we're not going to do that quite yet because I, I have something else I want to see. 2x minus 4. And like that looks done. Go ahead and pull out that 2 because it's going to show you you also have an x minus 2 right here. And furthermore, on the bottom of this guy, we have just a straight up x plus 2. I'm just going to rewrite it, but I'm going to put it in parentheses. Now, now, if I wanted to write these all together, all I really have to do to go to the next step, let's see if I can be fancy here, is just paste these together and write them under one fraction bar. Now they're multiplied. Okay, let me move these over if you really want to get picky. Okay, look. Now they're multiplied. But, of course, it's not reduced. Uh, before I reduce anything, don't forget, and you can do this little multiplication step, you should state your excluded values. What x's are illegal? So, what would be illegal here? Well, I see a bunch of negative 2s and positive 2s, so x should not be 2 or negative 2. Just don't forget those. Always state them. 
Now you've listed the excluded values, you can go ahead and start reducing things out. So get out your, your canceling pen. I like to use this rainbow pen for canceling. Just, just makes it more fun. Ooh, give me that pen. Just makes everything more fun if you have a good canceling pen, don't you guys think? Uh, so I see an x minus 2. Let's get rid of those. I see an x plus 2. Those will reduce out. And I see again an x minus 2 and an x minus 2. And get, guess what? This expression simplifies down to 2. With excluded values, x should not be 2 or minus 2. This is a weird one. This is very too heavy, but uh, maybe our textbook author was just pulling a little joke on us. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's how you deal with multiplication. Factor everything out, bring it all into one fraction, reduce all your common factors, and then you see what's left over. Um, by the way, just... I feel like a student question might be, because I'm kind of wondering, is it okay to have the answer itself be 2, even though I excluded the x value of 2? I think the answer is yes, and the reason is that this is not an x value. This isn't x equals 2 as a solution. This is just saying the entire expression is equivalent to the number 2. Uh, that's not what I want to do. The entire expression is equivalent to the number 2. It's not saying x is 2. So uh, we can still have that excluded x value, even though the all x's just disappeared from the situation. So all multiplying problems are pretty much the same. They're pretty much like the one above. Uh, but division problems can be tricky. And this is where people start to say, oh, man, that part of fractions, I really got, I really hated that part of fractions. Um, Division of fractions is not that bad. If you're okay with multiplying, you can do dividing. Here's the rule. If you have a over b divided by the fraction c over d, that is equivalent to the fraction a over b multiplied by the reciprocal of the second fraction, so d over c. So to do division, convert it to multiplication by the reciprocal. You've seen this before, right? Say I want to do, I have 20, and I want to divide it by 5. But I, my division key is broken. Oh, what can I do? Well, I could instead do 20 times 1 fifth. That would be the same thing. Uh, it would give you the same answer of 4. And same deal with fractions here. Um, and then right, multiplied, you get like a times d over b times c. So you then multiply and start canceling and reducing. Check it with numbers. One half divided by four thirds um, is the same as one half times three fourths, which ends up being three eighths. Works with numbers. Okay. Let's do some expressions. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is going to be fun. So I want to be really careful about excluded values here. It's uh, when you're doing problems like this, you kind of want to check for excluded values more than once. It's good to check at least twice uh, before and after you do that little flip and multiply maneuver. So right now, I uh, have no excluded values here because 7 is not 0. I'm not in danger. And I have no excluded values here because 9 is not 0. But if you think about it, I am dividing right there as well. And so I need to be sure that I'm not dividing by 0 for that whole term. Like, I don't want this whole term to be 0 either. Um, let's, think, let's table that, though, and turn this into the, the uh, reciprocal and multiply problem. So this would transform into this times 9 over 4x plus 20. That's not so bad. Ah, but now I see what's going on. I've created kind of a new denominator, but I need to also make sure it's not going to be 0. 
Uh, so that would tell me that x should not be negative 5. Boom. Uh, because 4 times negative 5 would be negative 20. Add 20, get 0. Sad day. All right. Uh, let's continue simplifying. So this is x plus 5 over 7 times 9 over 4 x plus 5. Oh, look at that. This is then 9x plus 5 over 7 times 4 is 28x plus 5. I have two terms multiplied together uh, on the top and bottom, so those can reduce to 1. And this whole expression altogether uh, reduces to 9 28. Uh, 9 is 3 times 3. 28 is 4 times 7. No factors in common. So this is the answer, but I am going to make another note that I still can't have x equal to negative 5 because that value would uh, cause the expression to be invalid even though there's no x's in the final answer. So that's pretty much how you do uh, the division. And the division problems get more complicated, but the method is the same. Your first step is you turn it into a multiplication problem. Be careful with your excluded values. You're good to go. If you can multiply, you can divide. We'll do more division later when we get multiple fractions all together, uh, but that's all I want to say about it for now. Let's move on to some addition of fractions. Adding. So adding with fractions is kind of the opposite of multiplying. Not, I guess dividing is the opposite of multiplying, but in terms of difficulty, you would think that multiplying would be harder. But it turns out that adding is actually harder with fractions because you have to be sure you know your, your matching denominators. Uh, so if you have, remember with just normal fractions or, or fractions of numbers and letters, if you have a over c plus b over c, you can combine those into a plus b over c. You add the numerators, but you don't add the denominators. And again, why is that? It's because the numerator and denominator in a fraction are kind of talking about different things. The numerator talks about the... Um, the, the denominator talks about the, the size of slice in your pizza, and the numerator talks about how many slices you, you have. So uh, you don't end up combining the denominators at all. So let's do an example of a problem where we do have a common denominator. This would simplify to, I am going to use the equal sign here, this would simplify to, well, just add the numerators. So you have 3x plus 3x is 6x, 2 plus 6 is 8. And then on the bottom, you should have uh, just 3x plus 4. So I think if I put this problem on a quiz, I would be trying to trick you into doing, oh, 3x plus 4. I know that's also 6x plus 8. But it's not because uh, think about what you're doing with the fractions. You are only adding the numerator. Now uh, we should do some reducing, though. I feel like 6x plus 8, isn't that 3 times, nope. How about a 2 times a 3x plus 4? That's true, right? So I've got 2 times 3x plus 4 over 3x plus 4. Oh man, I, I want to reduce these out to, to 2. Great. But I need to be sure I include any excluded values, so those are going to reduce out. But before I do, I need to make a note that 3x plus 4 needs to not be 0. Uh, this is an example of an excluded value where I might actually want to solve it. So, Because uh, it's not just obviously staring me in the face. Um, what you can do is set that equal to 0. Or you, you can do like this option too if you want. And then solve it. So you would get uh, 3x should not be negative 4. So x should not be negative 4 over 3. And I'll put that in there as an excluded value with my final answer. So that's adding with a like denominator. Um, what is important, though, I guess, with a like denominator is make sure you combine your terms and then uh, don't stop. Like, look to reduce after. Often when you're adding you'll have things that don't reduce or cancel until you add them up, and then they will reduce or cancel them. Um, 
You can even get into a situation where you add once, reduce, 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 and then you have to add again. Uh, I've seen that before too. Okay, so let's get some unlike denominators. Here's an example. So if I have an unlike denominator, I need to transform part of this. You can't just add these across and say, okay, this is x plus 3 over x times x minus 3 plus x. Not legal at all. I wish it was. My life would be a lot easier, and so would yours. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't work. So what do you need to do? Well, we need to transform this, but and if you notice I've been trying to not write the equal sign in this whole video. That's because these are expressions. And so things that you can do with an equal sign, like multiply both sides by something, for example, you can't do here. We only can do one move. The only thing I can do is take all or part of this thing and basically multiply it by one. So what I'm going to do is take the 2 minus 2 over x part of this and multiply it by 1. But not 1, 1. I'm going to multiply it by uh, a fraction that I come up with that will make it so that I have the same denominator. So I'm going to look at the first term and I say, okay, I, I have an x in both terms, but what I don't have is an x plus, minus 3. So I need to multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 3, or under x minus 3, I guess, uh, to make the second term have the same denominator as the first term. So let's do that out. So first term part won't change. Then I'll have 2. Uh, since I'm going to add these, I'm going to go ahead and distribute the 2 and make this 2x minus 6. Now I can go ahead and add because I've got a common denominator top and bottom. So 2x plus x is 3x, minus 6 plus 1 is minus 5. 3x minus 5 doesn't cancel because 3 and 5 are prime, or doesn't factor because 3 and 5 are prime. It's not common with any terms in the bottom, so this is fully, fully um, reduced. I need to state my excluded values, so x should not be 0 or positive 3 for the terms in the bottom. And this is, this is done. So my key piece of advice for things like this is to plan first before you just start multiplying. And what specifically should you be planning? You should be planning, what was that? What you want your common denominator to be. So before I started multiplying by x minus three over x minus three, I already knew that I wanted my denominator to be x times x minus three, just by inspecting the, the total sum of the equation, kind of looking at the big picture. Here's what I mean by that. Say I want to add all of these rational expressions. Ooh, this is a mess. And this is exactly the place where folks get a little bit uh, mix, mixed up, messed up. I'd encourage you to pause the video, actually, and try this problem. I know it's been a long video, so maybe you need a break, and maybe you want to try a problem on your own. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, so here's what you should not do. You should say, ah. You should not say, okay, he told us that he should plan, we should plan the denominator first. So I see a bunch of junk on the bottom. I'm going to plan that my new denominator is x plus 1, x plus 3, x minus 2, x plus 3, x plus 1, x plus 1. That is just taking everything from the bottom and like crunching it all into one massive denominator. Can you imagine if you multiplied that polynomial back out? It would be at least an x to the a sixth degree, right? X to the sixth plus dot, dot, dot. It would have, I guarantee you, like all seven other terms. No, thank you, please. Um, and how would you even get that denominator? Well, you'd have to take each term and multiply it by everything that's missing. So you need like an x minus 2, x plus 3, x plus 1. 
x plus 1, and that's just for the first term. That'd be like a fourth power on top. No! Don't do it that way. That's silly. I will say, if you did it that way, it would take you about a page of work and you'd get to the exact same place. There's nothing mathematically illegal about it. It's just stupid. What instead you want to look for is the least common multiple of all the terms in the denominator. So here's what I mean by that. I'm going to plan out my new denominator ahead of time. I'm going to give myself plenty of space and I'm going to build it piece by piece. So I'm going to say, uh, first I want to do is take all the factors of the first term. It can be any term, it's just easier to go from left to right. And I'm going to put those in there, x plus 1, 1, x plus 3. When I go to the second term, I'm going to get all factors that are not already listed. And that's how you get the least common multiple. I've already listed an x plus 3. So do I need to list it again? No, I do not. The only thing I need to add from that second term is the x minus 2. Now going to the last term, I'm going to get all factors that are not already listed from here, but I'm going to uh, make sure that I get, uh, remember, duplicates. So this one has two powers of x plus 1. I've already got one power, but I need another power for that term. So I do need to do an x plus 1 there. So the correct denominator, the correct denominator, will only have four terms. And that means that when I go to form the numerator, I'm not going to need to multiply by nearly as much. It's going to be a lot nicer. Now that we have a, de a denominator planned out, it's a lot easier to complete this problem. I've gone ahead and recopied it down here. Um, what's, I'm just going to use this as basically now a map telling me what to do. Uh, it's a lot easier to take a good trip if you have a map. So the first term will need, uh, you'll need to get these two terms, and you'll need them to the top and the bottom. The second term will need an x plus 1. It needs everything that's missing, and I guess it needs another x plus 1. So the only way I know what to multiply thereby is by looking at my goal, looking at my map. The third term, which I have to make a little room for, she needs a kind of extend. Uh, we have the x plus 1, so we need the x minus 2 and the x plus 3. Now that the denominator is all in common, all it remains to do is just add them up. Uh, I am going not going to do that live. I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader, although I'll put a, I'll probably pause and put a solution uh, right here in just a second. But go ahead and work that out if you would like some practice. And there's a solution for all you completists. Um, by the way, when you're dealing with the things on top like that, you should the move is just multiply them out like a quadratic. And then you can distribute the uh, the five or the, or the number term. And then it's just a bunch of algebra combining things and keeping track. Don't forget, as always, to state your excluded values. Um, I'm going to do two more examples from this section because I know people like them. If you're feeling really comfortable, uh, you can probably pause the video uh, or just skip ahead to the end of the examples. Um, there is some stuff at the end, though, that's important, so don't just quit here. Um, but example one, uh, we have this sort of expression. First move is factor the denominator of both terms. Oh, so we're subtracting here. Um, it's important to make note of, but nothing that's really going to change, except you do rem want to remember you're subtracting the entire numerator, so be sure you like distribute the minus sign properly. Uh, but this is going to be x uh, two terms 
uh, need to add to negative 24 but make negative 2. So how about minus 6 and plus 4? Seems good. Oh, we're subtracting. Looking for two terms again. How about uh, multiply to 6 and add to minus 7? So x minus 6, x minus 1. Aha, all right, it's a fraction situation, just like before. I'm going to think about what my new denominator is going to be. I need my new denominator to be all the things from the first term. Got those, got those. And then anything in the second term that I don't already have. So I already have the x minus 6. What I need is this x minus 1. So that's going to be my plan for the new denominator. It's going to have three terms instead of four because this x minus 6 was already in both, so I don't need to add it in. So that means, well, why don't I space this out a little more? If you give yourself some good kind of like room when you're writing these out, you can save yourself some pain and energy. This needs an x minus 1 to the top and bottom. The second one needs and what does not have? The x plus 4 to the top and bottom. So let's, uh, I think I can do this in one more step. This x has to distribute to both terms, so it's going to be x squared minus x. And then this x has to distribute to both terms, so it's going to be x squared plus 4x. But I said before, we are subtracting, so we're going to be subtracting and what are we subtracting? Well, we're subtracting everything in here. So that means that I need to subtract this entire thing, including the 4x. So I think a lot of folks would just subtract the x squared. Uh, but the x squares will reduce out, and you have minus x minus 4x, so we should get negative 5x over x minus 6, x plus 4, x minus 1. I didn't actually cancel anything out, so all I need to do is say the excluded values. x cannot be 6, 1, or minus 4. Um, folks always ask me, does it matter the order in which you list the excluded values? Answer is no. Some big to small, or small to big is always nice, but doesn't matter. Uh, so that's that one. Let's do another. All right, so here I'm just adding. Oh, I know why I like this example. Uh, I'm just adding things up, but there's, there's kind of a, a suspicious lack of x's all around. So let's see what we can do here. This is 5 over, why don't I factor out this 2? Why don't I factor out that 3? So it turns out that they already have an x plus 4 in common. So the only thing that you need to do in this problem is make sure that the numerical parts match up. So to make the numerical parts match up, why don't we multiply this by 3 over 3 and multiply this one by 2 over 2. So that the denominator will be 6x plus 4 and the numerator will be 15 plus 14, or what is that? 29 over 6, parentheses, x plus 4. I thought that was going to be harder than it was, um, just the way it started out looking. But it, sometimes the only work you have to do is with kind of good old numerical fractions like you've been doing since fourth grade. And don't forget your excluded values. x should not be negative 4. Not so bad. Um, just look for that least common multiple and then work out. So I, you know, if you're not looking for the least common multiple, this is a hard problem because what do you end up doing? You're doing like a 3x plus 12 here and a 2x plus 8 there and blah, 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 blah. You have to multiply all those x's out and guess what? It's going to turn into a 29 anyway. So why would you do all of that pain and then adding some condensing factoring when you could just factor first, look for the things in common, and work from there. I want to, at this point, thank you all for staying with me for this long. This is probably the, the longest section of chapter P 
It's multiple days, uh, but we're just going to do it all in one take. We have two more things to cover. Um, complex fractions is one thing that really ramps up the difficulty level um, and just going to put your algebra skills to the test. I think they're kind of fun. Uh, maybe you do too. I, I hope you do. Um, well, let's see what we mean. So what I mean by a complex fraction is something like this. Or, later on, something like this or that. Where you have at least three fraction bars uh, or more all together. What's important to remember, I would say three things that I wrote down earlier. Remember that when you think about uh, order of operations and like grouping uh, symbols, Fraction bars are a grouping symbol. So everything on the top of a fraction bar should be, has kind of an implied parentheses around it. Everything. Same with the denominator. It has an implied parentheses around it. And that means you can work with it as if it's its own term. Um, you also want to work, I think, from the smallest to the largest. And what I mean by that is um, starting with kind of the, the, the little pieces and working up to the larger fraction bars, using that example. And then finally, how do you work with these fractions? Well, remember when you're dividing fractions, you flip and multiply. So we wrote this before uh, in linear form, but if you write it in big fat fraction form, so you have a fraction A over B divided by the fraction C over D, you can convert that to multiplication by doing the reciprocal uh, of, in this case, the denominator. And you convert this to multiplication. Uh, but I want to highlight something, which is that this only works only works if in this form. So, for example, well, let's take a look at this. Uh, right now, I, in this problem here that we're about to do, we have an x over 4 minus 1. So I see the big fraction bar, but this is not of the form a over b yet. And because it's not of that form, doing this flip and multiply won't work yet. Instead, we're going to try to transition this or, or turn it into... Uh, something of the form a over b over c over d, so that I can flip and multiply. And that's going to be kind of my goal. Let's go ahead and do this problem. So right now, what I'd like to do is kind of flip this thing around and figure out what where the pieces are so I can, I can turn this into a multiplication problem instead of a division problem. I notice that this is the largest fraction bar. So I'm going to kind of highlight that and isolate these terms. I need to do two separate problems here. You need to take the first top part and get that into the form a over b, like one thing over one other thing. And the bottom part, I need to get into the form c over d. Bottom part's easy because it already is. I'm going to write it as this, x minus 4 over 1. You don't need that one, but it helps me kind of just keep track of where I am in the problem with what's being flipped and where, where it goes, uh, if I put that in there. Okay, we'll get rid of this. That's my goal. How am I going to do it? Well, I need to get one big fraction bar. So let's go ahead and do this addition. It's basically a subtraction problem. Within this fraction bar, I can go to this one and say, you know what? I don't want you to be a one. I want you to be a 4 over 4. Oh. So then this should really be x over 4 minus 4 over 4. I'll just write this as x minus 4 over 1. That should really then be x minus 4 over 4, because now I have a common denominator. You can carry out that subtraction over x minus 4 over 1. Guess what? Now this is in the form a over b over c over d. So we can turn this into a multiplication problem times the reciprocal of the bottom. 
Now we can reduce further. Boom, boom. And this reduces to one fourth. Now, even though this reduced to one fourth, it's still going to be important to state the excluded values. Because if those values aren't excluded, then it doesn't actually reduce, so you still have to state them. And when you have a complex fraction, the excluded values get a little more complex. Uh, and the reason is, if you think about it, how many fraction bars am I really looking at here? I've got one, two, three fraction bars. So I have to make sure that I'm not dividing by zero in any of those situations. So. Uh, let's double check. What would make this zero? Well, nothing, because four is not zero. That's not really a fraction bar, but I do need to avoid dividing by zero right here. So I need x to not be positive four. I'm going to go through the other steps and see if I divided by an x in any other place. Uh, I didn't here, no, because I'm only dividing by these. I already talked about that one. But right, like, wait, I'm going to go on, zoom in on this step right here. Because you can see when it's stacked up like this, how you would want to avoid all three of those circled terms being zero. You obviously want these to not be zero because they're on the bottoms of the little fraction bars. But you also need that term to not be zero because that would make the entire denominator of that fraction zero, which would make the biggest, you know, the, the big fraction outside uh, undefined. So that's why it's important to kind of look in all places for good excluded values. Uh, in this case, x should just not be 4. Let's do another one. That's really the big idea. We just now have to do some examples to, to look at strategies. Okay, so I'm going to do this one in two ways. I'm going to do the, the way that I don't like first, and then I'll show you what I think is a cool shortcut that you are definitely allowed to use. Uh, so I need to get, so I'm going to do my first way on the left here. My goal in all strategies is to get this of the form a over b over c over d, so that I can flip and multiply and get rid of all the fractions. Right now, I don't have a defined a and b, and I don't have a defined c and d, so I need a common denominator. Just like this is basically the problem from above, I, can, uh, I have an x, so I need to turn this into 8x over 8x, a or 8x over x, and I need to turn this into 4x over x by multiplying each term by x over x, uh, or each, each of the numbers by x over x. So then this becomes 8x plus 1 over x uh, over 4x minus 1 over x. This is a really good stage to state your excluded values. So x can definitely not be 0. Why? Because, well, I don't want to divide by 0. But it can also not be, uh, how about 1 fourth? Why not? Because that also can't be 0. If that was 0, I'd be dividing by 0 in this largest fraction bar. So I've got my excluded values stated. This is a really good place to do it. Now we'll flip and multiply. Ooh. Then we flip the bottom, and it becomes x over 4x minus 1. Those x's reduce out, and I get 8x plus 1 over 4x minus 1. And I'll add that to my little boxed answer. Not so bad. I chose that one on purpose. But now check out my other strategy. So the second strategy... is uh, to clear out denominators. I'll say denoms for denominators. Um, we, in the on the left, we kind of focused on the small terms. We said, okay, I need to get this thing to have a common denominator with that thing. Well, I have a big fraction too, don't I? So if you have a big fraction, you can multiply that big fraction by another big fraction. And you can put anything you want in your big fraction as long as it's the same thing over the same thing. And I know that if in an expression like this, if I multiply this by x, 
that'll cancel out that x. I'll have to distribute it, but I'll get rid of that fractions. So what if I multiply this by x over x? I have to do x over x because uh, I can only multiply by, by 1. But if I do this, well, the x here it has to distribute to both terms. So we get 8x plus, and then 1 over x times x, those cancel out and get 8x plus 1 divided by, this is the big fraction bar still, and then this x has to distribute to both terms here also. Well, I get 4x, and then I have minus 1 over x times x. Oh, that's minus 1. And look, it's the same answer. But it was a lot easier and a lot faster because I didn't have to then, I didn't have to form that big fraction and then flip and multiply. I was just able to clear out those, uh, those tiny fractions first. Uh, and so the general strategy here is, you know, it's not always going to be x over x. Uh, the thing that you put in this, in this sneaky fraction is the uh, least common multiple of, the, of all the denominators that you have kind of in, in the problem in the smaller fractions. And it won't always even be the same thing, so it can be a lot more complicated. But uh, in a problem like this, where you have that common x on the bottom, this was a much easier way just to clear that all out. And then it keeps everything nice and small and tidy, too. All right, let's do another one here. So I could, I have two choices, just like before. I have not solved this problem already. So I'm going to think out loud with you for a second. What I could do is focus on this denominator and get myself a common term. I guess I would need to get an x minus 2 on the bottom, so I would need an x minus 2 on the top. I think that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the other option I would have is to multiply the big fraction by the least common multiplier of all denominators here. So x minus 2 and x minus 2. Um, but I'm, I'm going to end up with that x minus 2 somewhere anyway, and I want to try this other strategy. So I need to transform this x to have a common denominator of x minus 2. So I'll multiply that to both terms here. Okay. The top of this fraction is still an x minus 3. The bottom then uh, becomes an x squared minus 2x minus 3 all over x minus 2. So that was that common denominator move. Now here's another good place. Uh, why don't I do, let's factor this. So that's going to be. Uh, x minus 3, x plus 1, x minus 2. That looks right. I kind of lost track of my fraction bar. I'm trying to make sure that this top fraction bar is written a little bit larger to kind of indicate the order of grouping. It can be hard. Now let's go ahead and list, before I do any flipping, the excluded values. So, in it, I have two fraction bars. I need to make sure the bottom of both fraction bars is not 0. So I need x to not be 2. That's for that term. But I also need it to not be negative 1 or positive 3. Why? Because if either of those are 0, if x is negative 1 or 3, that will make the highlighted term 0, which will cause us to divide by 0 right here, which we also need to avoid. All right, so I've got the excluded values listed. Now let's go ahead and flip and multiply. So in this case, this is going to be like x minus 3 over 1 times x minus 2 over x minus 3x plus 1. 
And I'm glad we did it this way because I can see how something is going to cancel out now. The x minus 3s will cancel. And you end up with x minus 2 over x plus 1. And you still have those three excluded values. Um, you can, of course, see the excluded values from this step, too. You can say, oh, well, I, of course I have to exclude 3 and 1. They're now on the bottom. Uh, but then if you only look in that step, you might forget that you also have to exclude the 2. So just make sure you're looking for excluded values, I think, before you flip that fraction to make sure you get all of them. All right, and you've made it to the last example. Uh, so here I have a lot of different things going on. I see it as x squared. The first thing I want to do is transform. Oh, man, a lot of stuff on here. All right. I'm going to save myself some energy and think about what x squared minus 4 is. That's really x plus 2 times x minus 2. Okay? And what I notice is that the, I have an x minus 2 in a denominator at least twice. So that seems like a good place to try this trick of multiplying by a sneaky version of 1 so that I can clear out the denominators. Um, but if I'm going to clear out x squared minus 4, I need to multiply by the whole x squared minus 4. So let's, if we're going to do that, let's multiply by x plus 2, x minus 2, and x plus 2, x minus 2. If it helps, by the way, you can write this as like being over 1 over 1, just to help you see what, what cancels out. Uh, I, I do like that. So then, I think this is going to work out nicely. I'll leave the denominator first because it's prettier. Um, this, those both terms have to distribute to both things here. So in the first term, the whole x squared minus 4 cancels out and you just get 3. Then it's plus 1 times x plus 2, x minus 2. Maybe a little unneeded parentheses there, I'm not sure. On the top, uh, I have to distribute both of these to both terms here. So we'll see that, that thing with the 1 again. Uh, but on the top, the x minus 2s would cancel. The x plus 2 would stay, so I would get an x times x plus 2 for the first term, then plus 1, x plus 2, x minus 2. This isn't particularly nice, but what I have done is clear out all the fractions. And so uh, at this point, I'm now into a single fraction problem. Let's combine all the like terms in the top and bottom and see where we go. Um, so we get x squared plus 2x uh, plus x squared minus 4. Remember that this is just x squared minus 4, because that's where it came from. Here I will get 3 plus x squared minus 4. Combining terms again, 2x squared Well, this is beautiful. What a nice problem that our author has prepared for us. Factor a 2 out of the top. And factor the bottom as a difference of squares. We brought the 3 in with the 4, so now this is x plus 1, x minus 1. And the top should also have an x plus 2 and an x minus 1. I'm trying not to run into my camera. Okay, there. Those x minus 1s will cancel, and this thing should reduce to 2, x plus 2, over x plus 1. Done. Uh, state your excluded values. 
go back to a step before you, you cross cancel things. Uh, X should not be um, plus or minus one. Looks okay. Anything else that we need? Uh, no, because that was no, there's no X up there, so I'm not in danger of dividing by zero there. But in the original, I am in danger of dividing by zero if we're plus or minus two, so I should also forbid plus or minus two. I think that's uh, where you get multiple excluded values in a situation like that. The other way to approach this problem, of course, to zoom back in, would be to convert this one into x minus two over x minus two, and this one into x squared minus four over x squared minus four. Convert those terms into those terms, the ones into things, group, combine, uh, you end up with a, a stacked fraction, and then you could flip and multiply. It might actually have been easier. I might have made it harder on myself this time, um, but either way will work. So uh, that's how you approach a problem like this. And that, I think, is where I'm going to leave it. There's a couple more uh, sections in the book that you'll see on homework that are going to push you to your limits, but I think you can do them. The best thing you can do for yourself is practice. Uh, and not just practice by like inspecting the problem, but practice by putting your pencil to your paper, doing the math, and then checking your work and asking good questions. That's the best way that you can get over this this hump uh, that a lot of people often have when they come when it comes to fractions like this. So, thank you all for watching. Let me know what questions you have, and I will see you all next time.